Hello friends, I hope this message finds you well. Uh, once again, I'm coming to you from my, my home. The uh, technical aspect of hooking up our camera to an upgraded sound system in the sanctuary um, have not uh, been figured out yet, mainly because I haven't taken the time to play with things. But I wanted to send this message out to you uh, for this day, Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday in our current lectionary year. Uh, next Sunday that we gather together will be the first Sunday in Advent. Um, this is Christ the King Sunday, and our gospel reading today comes from John's Gospel. Then the Jewish authorities took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had prophesied when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? And Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to you. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Friends, grace to you and peace this day from Jesus who was and is and who is to come to bring us new life. Amen. Today, we conclude our current liturgical year with a special Sunday, Christ the King Sunday. I want to share some thoughts with you and help us together answer what it might mean to say that Christ is the King. I'm using inspiration and information here from a piece published in the Christian Century magazine, The Current Issue, by Pastor Denise Anderson, and I want to give her credit where credit is due. Now, observing Christ the King Sunday began in 1925, almost a hundred years ago. The Catholic Pope Pius XI set the day, and its formal title I have to read carefully, when he set the day, the Pope called it the feast day of the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe. That's a pretty long title, so we just call it Christ the King Sunday. The Pope didn't institute this holy day on a whim. He did it intentionally and prayerfully to address the world of his day. You see, in 1925, Europe was still coming out of the years uh, in, that included the Great War, World War I. And in 1925, Adolf Hitler had just published the first volume of his manifesto, Mein Kampf. Among other things, that writing detailed his descent into anti-Semitism, and it outlined some sinister designs for world domination. Hitler met his times. And the times in 1925 were ripe to hear his message of nationalistic promise for a defeated people. The times of 1925 were ripe for the racist blaming of problems on the Jewish people of God. The signing of the Locarno treaties that year meant that Germany would not have all of the privileges it had before starting the war and before its defeat. 
Those treaties were met with disdain by many in Germany who were extremists. They viewed the treaties as a betrayal of Germany and a weakening of its power and influence in the world. Granted, they had just lost a war. Hitler met the world of his day, the world of his day, and he tapped into a sense of nationalism, of victimhood, and of fear that permeated much of Germany in those years following World War I. The Pope met the world of his day too, and we have Christ the King Sunday in response to those things that were happening in Europe in that day. Remember that nations had just risen against nations in a war like the world had never seen, kingdoms against kingdoms. And the Pope wanted the church to have a message. Now, a year later, in 1926, more than 40,000 members of the Ku Klux Klan marked on, marched on our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Those 40,000 hooded marchers demanded among other things, that immigration restrictions based on race and nationality be imposed. They claimed to be victims of people who were taking their birthright from them. Citizenship, the marchers said, carried privilege. White skin carried privilege. They screamed this angrily in their marches. Anyone who was not a citizen should be deported. And even if they were citizens, but not of pure white race, they too should be deported. With membership of over 5 million at that time, the Ku Klux Klan was the largest fraternal organization in the United States. Today, our ELCA has fewer members than the Klan did at that time. And our own city of Denver in those days was run by the Klan. You can read about that in Denver history. So the world was navigating the aftermath of the Great War, and there was growing nationalist sentiment around the globe. Pius wanted to counter what he perceived to be an unhealthy nationalism and increased secularism. So he prayed, and he read scripture. And he read the same Bible, by the way, that the Ku Klux Klan claimed to read and believe. Pius decided to use his voice and his office to turn people to a more Christian view of the world, of God's creation, and of all God's people who share the world, the world that God made and the world over which God reigns. After his prayer and study, Pius called the church to declare Christ's kingship over all creation. The Christian's first allegiance is to Christ, the Pope reasoned, whatever the nation of their citizenship. Regardless of where in the Christian world they live, they should be guided by their values as followers of Jesus. And regardless of the color of their skin, Christians should be guided by their values as followers of Christ over and above national movements or cultural ethics. Certainly, racial prejudice had no place in a Christian movement, he prayed. So he taught that Christians ought to speak up against racist tendencies, against nationalist movements. Years after warring madness, of fighting between earthly kingdoms, the Pope reminded the Church of its true allegiance to Jesus and that Christ's kingship is not found in nationalism or in any earthly kingdom. Now the reading that I just read from John today brings us into the Good Friday story. Jesus before Pilate. Rome's prefect in Israel didn't really know what to do with Jesus when the Jewish authorities brought Jesus to him. Jesus hadn't robbed anybody. He didn't kill anyone. He didn't commit treason, at least not by Roman standards. Jesus was accused of saying he is a king. So 
Pilate asked Jesus if he was king of the Jews. Now, even Pilate's question was a misnomer because Jesus never indicated that his kingdom is limited to the Jewish people, to the Jewish nation. What he did say was that his kingdom was not of this earth. So what then is the nature of Christ's kingdom? It has something to do with truth, he told Pilate. Everyone who belongs to the truth is included in Christ's kingdom, Jesus said. Truth is Christ's reign, and those who belong to the truth are Christ's people, are his subjects. And there are no borders in Christ's kingdom. Everyone who belongs to the truth across geographic, civic, racial, or ideological borders, hears his voice. The citizenship test for the kingdom of God could not be more clear or simple. I want to share with you some of Pastor Denise Anderson's words because I don't think I can say them any better than she did when she wrote this. In a world in which misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories abound, the truth is not always obvious. The lies are often much louder, more insistent, and definitely more abrasive. But the truth remains important in Jesus' reign. It's important when politicians maligned, malign, malign migrants as endemically criminal. It's important, the truth, when these politicians conveniently ignore that most crimes in the United States are committed by citizens. The white grievances seen on the National Mall in 1926, that grievance has persisted in today's book bans, in the dismantling of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging initiatives, and the twisting of school curricula. Christian nationalism in the U.S. remains perhaps the single most powerful threat both to democracy and to Christianity. And media outlets that claim a commitment to truth and fairness brazenly produce content that is anything but those things. Our pastor goes on to say, the truth is anathema in this age, probably because it's easier and often more profitable to deal in lies. Lies concentrate power among the few while the truth disperses it among the many. She goes on to say, when we love our neighbors as ourselves, when we do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God, and when we care for the afflicted and stand up for the oppressed, then we abide in truth and count ourselves as citizens of Jesus' unique kingdom. The lie is fear, she says. Scarcity narratives stroke the fear that we don't have enough. When scripture assures us God knows and intends to provide for our needs, these scarcity narratives say that scripture lies. The fear that siblings with different or no citizenship papers would all seek to do us harm affronts God's truth that commands us to welcome the stranger among us. Fear is a lie. Love is the truth. So, she resolves, quote, a recommitment to truth in these times is in order for everyone, but especially for Christ's church. Without it, we may spiritually and literally find ourselves nationless. When I read her words, they made me think. Her words should make the church think. Pope Pius did that a century ago when he started this holiday to help people think about what it really means to live as citizens in the kingdom of God. And our pastor does it today. 
Christ still reigns in his kingdom, which is not of this world. Do we belong to that kingdom? I say we do. We belong to that kingdom, to the truth, to the one who claims us in baptism. Jesus, we belong to the kingdom that Jesus ushers us into. So then, let us live as citizens of Christ's reign. For that is how all the people of the world, no matter their nation or their color or their ethnic background, all people will know that we are citizens of Christ first. They will know it by our love. Amen.